All right, welcome to the second video in the network security portion of the JNCIE SP. I mean, there's multiple network security portions, uh, authentication on BGP, ISAS, OSPF. Um, I'm not sure about ISAS, but yeah, protocol authentication is a security topic, but this particular one is preventing DDoS distributed denial of service attacks on BGP by setting up remotely triggered black holes so that any traffic we don't want <clears throat> coming into our autonomous, our autonomous system is not going to be propagated through to other devices. So I've got a, a network here, topology that I had set up. So this example includes three routers with external BGP, eBGP sessions established. Device R1 represents the attacking device. Device R3 represents the router closest to the device that is being attacked. So, aha, so here's the, the attacking device. And here is the device being attacked, R2. Oh, no, no, no. The device being attacked would be beyond R1. Sorry, beyond R3. Uh, but R2 is going to mitigate the attack. So that's the most important one. Device 3 represents the router closest to the device that is being attacked. Device R2 mitigates the attack by forwarding packets to the discard interface. This example shows an outbound filter applied to the discard interface. Note, an issue with using a single black hole filter is visibility. All discard packets increment the same counter. To see which categories of packets are being discarded, use destination class usage, DCU, and associate a user-defined class with each black hole community, then reference the DCU classes in a firewall filter, for related examples, see example grouping source and destination prefixes into a forwarding class and example configuring a rate limiting filter based on destination class. Compared to using route filters and access lists, a community value is the least administratively difficult and most scalable approach. Therefore, this is the example shown in this example. Hopefully that's what's on the test, but um, I would be kind of disappointed if the test wanted you to know the most administratively difficult and least scalable approach. I, I'm hoping the test really can apply to the real world and this particular example where it is the least administratively difficult and the most scalable would be what they want you to know. By default, the next hop must be equal the what? By default, the next hop must be equal the external BGP eBGP peer address. So not worth the downvote. Um, unfortunately, um, that sentence has bad grammar. Altering the next hop for black hole services requires the multi-hop feature to be configured on the eBGP sessions. So we've got the quick configuration and the step-by-step. -step. We're just gonna do the quick configuration, gloss over the step-by-step, -step, see if there's anything interesting more to, to know in there. But let's get started. So router one. Edit, and luckily the interfaces were able to match on this, uh, F120 ends in zero, so I'm using GE000. The other interfaces they're using end in one. Luckily, they're using unit zero on this one, finally. Uh, it's the only valid interface you can use.
All right, so really simple configuration on here. Now remember, this is the attacking device. So let's see if we can tell how it's, why it is the attacking, the attacking device. So I guess I don't see how it's the attacking device now. Um, I wish it were more clear about that. But um, in fact, it doesn't even have an export policy. So yeah, I'm really not sure how this is the attacking device. Um, hopefully they'll explain that in more detail as we continue on with the exercise. I mean, I would think in order to attack BGP, you'd export a, a certain kind of undesirable route or something like that. But you can see it's very stripped down, basic config, no exporting, no nothing. So yeah, I'm excited to learn about what part of that configuration was malicious. Ah, here's our classic DSCP interface. Uh, not DSCP. So DSCP is a QoS bit marking. That's why that kind of <laughs> pull it out for now. And let's, it's a DSC interface for here. Well, don't pull it out because QoS is going to be a big uh, part of this exam as well. Um, DSCP bits, um, IP precedence bits, and um, COS bits um, are all going to be important concepts for uh, QoS, but here we're talking about remotely triggered black holes, and we're talking about a DSC interface, a discard interface. So here's our good old multi, multi, ah, so this isn't multipath. This is the multi hop command. So we're going to be building a BGP, EGP, EBGP connection to an address that isn't a direct route. So let's look at, yeah. So, oh, it's kind of interesting that they include this multi hop on there because we're not actually having anything, any neighbor address that is um, not a directly connected route. So I'm not sure why that's on there. Um, hopefully, you know, I'm excited to learn. Hopefully the um, documentation will explain why that is on there. You are adding the pure AS at the neighbor level. You can add it, of course, at the group level or for the whole protocol.
All right, so let's try to find the help topic for this. Um, yeah, unfortunately, um, I'm not sure how we can do that. So let's see help topic PGP. And now is there something for <clears throat> maybe import, maybe, yeah, I'm not sure what is special about this. Maybe we can do help topic interface DSDSC. Aha, so perfect. We've got a discard interface allows you to protect a network from denial of service DOS attacks by identifying the target IP address that is being attacked and configuring a policy to forward all packets to a discard interface. All packets forwarded to this discard interface are dropped. So we've got lots of really good information here about how to proceed with this that will be available during the test. Yeah, I don't see anything specific to creating a DSC export policy for BGP, but even just having this I think is going to be useful. All right, so one last router to configure. Perfect, so we're all good to go. Let's do the step-by-step, -step or, or let's read over the step-by-step, -step. Just, just, uh, just skim it real quick to see if there's anything extra we need to know. So here we've, we configured a firewall filter that matches all packets and counts and logs the packets. Discard interface. Input firewall filters have no impact in this context. BGP peering, routing policies. Yep, so just simple stuff. Um, let's do our own verification step and uh, make sure that the BGP memberships are up. Yep, so that one's an established. Yep, and both are established there, perfect. All right, so let's send packets to the destination address. So on, so, so let's, let's start up two Wireshark captures, one on each link, and we'll see on the second link, it won't have propagated through. We'll see it on this first capture here, but due to the protection we set up on order two, will not be propagating over across the link on router three. Okay, so let's ping that address. So this is where we're simulating that attack. We're saying we're gonna go after this address, but since that's malicious, we know that we don't want people <laughs> um, trying to bring down our server um, at this address we're gonna block uh, external access to it or, or whatever this is, if this is a, a restricted thing that we don't want to be a part of the public internet, we can set up these special rules and not have it be accessible. So as expected, the ping request fails and no response is sent. The packets are being discarded so we can see packets are in fact sent. Um, we'll see that very clearly here. Yep, there they are. But on the second capture, 
Uh, we don't see any ICMP traffic at all because they were denied by that policy. So let's check the output filter, verify that device R2's firewall filter is functioning properly. Action from device R2, enter the show firewall filter log discard command. Oops. We have all sorts of packets so far. It looks like we got 62, 69 now. So yep, that's working as, as expected. As expected, the counter is being incremented. Let's see where it's at now. 87. The ping packet carries an additional 20 bytes of IP overhead as well as eight bytes of ICMP header. Checking the community attributes. Purpose, verify that the route is being tagged with the community attributes. Action from device R1, enter the show route extensive command using the neighbor address for device R2, 192.0.2.101. So this is to verify that the route is being tagged with the community attributes. There it is. Meaning, as expected, when device R2 advertises the 192.0.2.101, route to device R1, device R2 adds the 10, uh, the 100 colon 5555 community tag. So that's interesting. So it looks like, aha, so, so here's what's going on. You, you can get, so, so this, this address is um, being sent out, but it's just preventing it from being reached by just anybody. You only want the people to reach it that you want to reach it. Oh, that could be a problem there. I'm gonna fix that. I'm surprised there weren't issues. Okay, so let's look at that closer now. Yep, everything, I don't see anything jumping out at me now. So we've got a export policy, DSC-export. Let's look at this in closer detail. So here's DSCP. So, so our routes here. Yep, we're going to set the black hole all routers. So community here. Um, and then, yeah, so we're going to send that out. So this is how we can kind of send a route out, but say if anyone along the way, um, you, you can get out, but you can't get in. It's like, it's like a barbed uh, fish hook where it goes in, but it can't come back out because you've set the, the next hop yes to me, but I've set a community tag on it. So if you try to come back in, your route's gonna be tagged with, with that barb, um, as if on a fish hook, and uh, I will know to toss it out um, because it's it's part of this community. Uh, I think that's how it works. 
Actually, I'm not sure how that works. Oh, yeah, 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 this is how it works because it's going to set the next top to 192.0.2.101, which is um, which is the discard interface address. See, one thing I'm confused about though is why you have an address and a destination. Like, why can't the address of this just be 192.0.2.101? It seems like it'd be a lot easier. I don't understand why this is necessary. Um, okay, but I, I mean, I finished the exercise, so let's uh, close this and uh, hopefully I can answer that question. So let me type that question out. So why do you need to specify? So on a DSC interface, why do you need both an address and a destination address? And let's, let's put that whole thing just right into Google um, because I, I kind of am curious about that. And, and again, that's one of our running themes um just to kind of investigate dive deeper i could easily just you know forget about that not understand it but um <clears throat> that's not uh something i i would like and it's not something that's going to help me during the test so So the discard DSC interface is a virtual interface that can silently discard forwarded packets as they are received. No ICMP messages sent. It is useful in the case of denial of service DOS attacks. Once you know the IP address that is being targeted, you can configure a policy to forward all packets received on that interface to the discard interface where they will be dropped Oh, okay, so that, that's why you don't necessarily know what address it is. I think you can just put it on the interface, but you can put extra addresses that um, you want to be, um, that you know are going to be targeted. Um, yeah, so let me just read this. Silently discarding packets that have no valid route in the associated forward table can prevent the, the device from becoming a distributed denial of service DOS reflector in which a spoofed source IP address is used to trigger a flood of ICMP error messages from the device. So you can saturate a whole link just by having a device respond to you saying, hey, I don't know what this address is. People can use that to uh, to deny you from your service, um, delivering your service. Okay, so here's the RFC. It actually doesn't look like it's that super long. So I think I'm gonna read the whole RFC and then that will be the end of this uh, topic. Um, yeah, pretty short topic. Um, I'm not sure if I, if I feel 100% competent are confident with this uh, and ready to do it on the test, but I'll mark it down and I'll move on. As I said in, in multiple videos, um, I'm, I'm kind of concerned I'm spending too much time on this. Um, so th this will be kind of a, a good, um, a, a good point to, to move on. Um, I don't think I need to spend too much time on this. So let's read the RFC, mark it done. And then the next video will be on BGP scaling techniques such as route configuration and route reflection. Remote triggered black hole filtering with unicast reverse path forwarding, U-R-P-F. Um, so there's no um, obsoleted ones, there's no newer ones. This is the RFC for remote triggered black hole filtering for BGP. Abstract. Remote triggered black hole RTBH filtering is a popular and effective technique for the mitigation of denial of service attacks. This document expands upon destination based 
RTBH filtering by outlining a method to enable filtering by source address as well. Okay, so it looks like this is um, a RFC based on, on another one. This is not the main RFC for, for this. Um, <clears throat> let's, um, let's try to find that because uh, that's what we just learned about, obviously, in, in the last exam was destination-based RTBH filtering. Um, so that's kind of more fresh in my mind than source-based. Yeah, so unfortunately, this looks like it's it's kind of hard to find. Um, this is the only one I see. I don't see where um, where there's an RFC for destination-based RTBH filtering that this RFC is expanding upon. But I might have just misinterpreted this abstract. It's just the abstract. Introduction. This document expands upon, oh, well, it's right there. <laughs> upon the technique outlined in configuring BGP to block denial of service attacks, RFC 3882. Let's see how long this is. And uh, I might wanna read, oh, it's super short as well. So I'll, I'll read both of these. To demonstrate a method that allows for filtering by source addresses, network operators have developed a variety of techniques for mitigating denial of service DOS attacks. While different techniques have varying strengths and weaknesses from an implementation perspective, the selection of which method to use for each type of attack involves evaluating the trade-offs associated with each method. A common DOS denial of service attack directed against a customer of a service provider involves generating a greater volume of attack traffic destined for the target then will fit down the links from the service providers to the victim customer. This traffic starves out legitimate traffic and often results in collateral damage or negative effects to other customers or the network infrastructure as well. Rather than having all destinations on their network be affected by the attack, the customer may ask their service provider to filter traffic destined to the target destination IP addresses or address for the service provider or the service provider may determine that this is necessary themselves in order to preserve network availability. One method that the service provider can use to implement this filtering is to deploy access control lists on the edge of their network. While this technique provides a large amount of flexibility in the filtering, it runs into scalability issues, both in terms of the number of entries in the filter and the packet rate. Okay, so this one I, I actually was pretty curious about, why can't you just use a, a access control list? But it's because BGP is meant for, um, large numbers of routes, so larger than an access control list can control. Most routers are able to forward traffic at a much higher rate than they are able to filter, and they are able to hold many more forwarding table entries and routes than filter entries. RTBH, remotely triggered black holes, filtering leverages the forwarding performance of modern routers to filter more entries and at a higher rate than access control lists would otherwise allow. So this is a good point. Um, I actually used to host something publicly and I would get attacked on it. And um, a lot of the times if you block an IP from the attacker, they'll just use a different IP. I mean, if they've got a slash 24, they've got all kinds of IPs to choose from. So you, you're gonna to need to, to block whole uh, 
network addresses and not just single IP. So you really, an attacker really has a lot of IPs that they can choose to attack you from. So you've really got to have a policy like RTBH to block whole spans of network addresses instead of something where you, you don't have that scalability to it. However, with destination-based RTBH filtering, the impact of the attack on the target is complete. That is destination-based RTBH remotely triggered black hole filtering injects a discard route into the forwarding table for the target prefix. All packets towards that destination attack traffic and legitimate traffic are then dropped by the participating routers, thereby taking the target completely offline. The benefit is that collateral damage to other systems or network availability at the customer location or in the ISP network is limited, but the negative impact to the target itself is arguably increased. By coupling unicast reversed path forwarding, URPF, RFC 3704 techniques with RTBH remotely triggered black hole filtering, BGP border gateway protocol can be used to distribute discard routes that are based not on destination or target addresses, but on source addresses of unwanted traffic. Note that this will drop all traffic to and from the address and not just the traffic to the victim. So let's see how, how long this is. I, this I think is getting into the rabbit hole. I uh, kind of, um, yeah, and it's super long, so I, I'm not gonna be reading that. This document is broken up into three logical parts. The first outlines how to configure a destination-based RTBH, remotely trigger black hole. The second covers source-based RTBH. And the third part has examples and a history of this technique. Destination-based RTBH filtering overview. A discard route is installed on each edge router in the network with the destination set to the discard or null interface. In order to use RTBH filtering for a single IP address or prefix, a BGP route for the address to be filtered is announced with the next hop set as the discard route. This causes traffic to the announced network prefix to be forwarded to the discard interface so that it does not transmit the network wasting resources or triggering collateral damage to other resources along the path towards the target. While this does complete the attack in that the target addresses are made unreachable, collateral damage is minimized. It may also be possible to move the host or service on the target IP addresses to other addresses and keep the service up, for example, by updating associated DNS uh, records. Detail, before deploying RTBH filtering, there is some preparation and planning that needs to occur and decisions that need to be made. These include what are the discard addresses? What are the discard BGP communities? What is the largest prefix that can be black holed? What is the smallest advertisement that your provider will accept? Steps to configure destination-based RTBH filtering. Number one, select your discard address schema. An address is chosen to become the discard address. This is often chosen from 192.0.2.0/24. Oh, that's interesting. I actually did not know um, that was significant in the example. Testnet RFC 3330 or from the good old RFC 1918 private space. That's the 10/8.172.16/12. 
and the 192.168/16 address space. Multiple addresses allow an operator to configure multiple static routes, one for each incident. Customer one who has a DDoS distributed denial of service attack can be pointed to discard route 192.0.2.1. Customer two can be pointed to discard route 192.0.2.2. If capable, the router can then count the drops for each, providing some level of telemetry on the volume of drops as well as status of an outgoing attack. A consistent address schema facilitates operations. Step two, configure the discard routes on each router. A route for the discard address is installed on the routers that form the edge slash perimeter of the network in all routers in the network or some subset. Example, peering but not customer ETC. The destination of the route is set to the discard or null interface. This route is called the discard route. Implementation experience demonstrates the value of configuring each ingress router with a capability for dropping traffic via RTBH filtering. Step three, configure the RTBH BGP policy on each router. A BGP policy is configured on all routers that have discard route so that, that have the discard route so that routers announced with a chosen community will have their next hop set to the discard address. The BGP community should be made restrictive so that only BGP routes covering a defined number of host addresses will be accepted. That is typically only specific slash 32s are necessary. Shorter prefix blocks may also be required or desirable. For example, if larger numbers of attack targets are located within a single prefix, or the employment of this mechanism is to drop traffic bound for specific networks. When filtering based on shorter prefixes, extreme caution should be used as to avoid collateral damage to other hosts that reside within those address blocks. Full implementations will have multiple communities with each community used for different parts of a provider's network and for different security incidents. Configure the safety egress prefix filters. There is always a chance that the targeting BGP update could leak from the network and go and so egress prefix filters are strongly recommended. These egress prefix filters are strongly, these egress filter, egress prefix filter details may vary, but experience has demonstrated that the following works. And I'm just gonna make a note here because I've got to pick up some groceries at 8.30 tonight. And I just know reading this that I could be reading this at 8.25 and forget to go and pick up my groceries at 8.30. It's kind of a nightmare scenario that I have done many times. All right. Deny all prefixes longer than the longest prefix that you expect to announce. For example, if the longest prefix that you expect to announce is slash 24, deny all prefixes of length 25 through 32. If your triggering BGP update is only slash 32s, then this egress prefix filter will add a safe measure in case the no export community does not work. That's interesting. So you wanna do an or longer even on um, slash 32s. Deny all communities used for targeting RTBH filtering. This is also a safety measure in case the no export community does not work. This is actually quite a bit longer than I, well, 
No, it's not. Step five, configure the trigger router. Configure the trigger router workstation or other device so that adding and removing the triggers can be done easily and quickly. The BGP update should have the no export community as a mandatory attribute. The egress prefix filter or policy that prevents RTBH remotely triggered black hole filtering prefixes in the slash eight to slash 24 range is also recommended as a safety tool. The trigger router can be set up as an iBGP internal BGP route reflector client that does not receive any prefixes from its BGP peer. This allows a low cost router slash workstation to be used as the trigger router. Using the RTBH remotely triggered black hole filtering. When the RTBH filtering is desired for a specific address, that address is announced from a trigger router or route server tagged with the chosen RTBH community and with the no export community and passed via IBGP. The receiving routers check the BGP policy, set the next hop to be the discard route, resulting in a forwarding information base, FIB entry, pointing to a discard address. Traffic entering the network will now be forwarded to the discard address on all edge routers and will therefore be dropped at the edge of the network, saving resources. Multiple discard addresses for incident granularity. This technique can be expanded by having multiple discard addresses, routes, and communities to allow for monitoring of the discarded traffic volume on devices that support multiple discard interfaces. As mentioned earlier, each router can have a discard address schema to allow the operator to distinguish multiple incidents from each other making it easier to monitor the life cycle of the incidents. Multiple trigger communities for network-wide granularity. The network can be sectioned into multiple communities, providing the operator with an ability to drop in discrete parts of their network. For example, the network can be divided into the following communities where XXX represents the operator's AS number. So 600, ah, I remember these are communities. So just like in, um, so we're gonna see in this Wireshark capture here, um, yeah, we're gonna see, uh, uh, well, we're not gonna see any, any update messages um, because those already happened, so BGP dot, update dot path attribute. Yeah, we're, we're not getting any of these, unfortunately. Um, let's just see what, B oh, God damn it. see, I hate that when it saves the last one you used. Uh, okay, so yeah, these are unfortunately all keep alive, so we're just not gonna get those. But I'll, I'll pull up the um, device, um, well, yeah, 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 and then, and then we'll see, um, show configuration, type display set, type no more. I'm gonna have to do this on router two, actually. So, yep, just like a, so th these are communities, so, Colon 600 would be RB, RTBH filtering all routers. 601 would be only peering routers. 602, only customers who peer BGP. So 602, you'll probably see, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just keep these in mind if you're ever in prod and you get a, a chance, you get read-only access on the, on the whole network. Yeah, look up for these communities, 600, 601, 602, 603. Uh, there's a, good chance that they'll be there. And 603 is for filtering on data centers to see if the data center is the source of the attack. 604, filtering on all customers to see how many customers are being used by the attacker. 
Some diligent thinking is required to develop a community schema that provides flexibility while reflecting topological consideration. Customer triggered RTBH, remotely triggered black hole filtering. The technique can also be expanded by relaxing the autonomous system, AS path rule to allow customers of a service provider to enable RTBH filtering without interacting with the service provider's trigger routers. If this is configured, an operator must accept only accept announcements from the customer for prefixes that the customer is authorized to advertise. In order to prevent the customer from accidentally or intentionally black holing space that they are not allowed to advertise, a common policy for this type of setup would first permit any longer prefix with an unauthorized prefix only if the black hole communities are attached. Append no exports, no advertise, or similar communities, and then also accept from the customer the original aggregate prefix that will be advertised as, a, as standard policy permits. Extreme caution should be used in order to avoid linking any more specifics beyond the local routing domain unless policy explicitly aims at doing just that. Um, yep, so we're almost done here. Thank, thank goodness. Um, oh, we get we get a Cisco. Oh, we get. Um, oh, here we go. Yeah, yeah. Look at this. So we get a, a Juniper configuration sample. That's really nice. Um, yeah, it's not a complete configuration. It needs to be customized before you're using it. But um, yeah, that that's really nice that they provide that. Source address RTBH filtering. In many instances, denial of service attacks sourced from botnets are being configured to follow DNS. Attacking machines are instructed to attack example.com and re-resolve this periodically. Historically, the attacks were aimed simply at an IP address, and so renumbering www.example.com to a new address was an effective mitigation. It makes it, this makes it desirable to employ a technique that allows black holding to be based on source address. By combining traditional RTBH remotely triggered black hole filtering with unicast reverse path forwarding, URPF, a network operator can Filter based upon the source address, URPF, unicast reverse path forwarding, performs a route lookup of the source address and of the packet and checks to see if the ingress interface of the packet is a valid egress interface for the packet source address strict mode or if any route to the source address of the packet exists loose mode. If the check fails, the packet is typically dropped. In loose mode, some vendors also verify that the destination route does not point to an invalid next hop. This allows source-based RTBH filtering to be deployed in networks that cannot implement strict or feasible path mode. URPF, unicast reverse path forwarding, before enabling URPF in any mode, it is vital that you fully understand the implications of doing so. Strict mode will cause the router to drop all ingress traffic if the best path back to the source address of the traffic is not the interface from which the traffic was received. Asymmetric routing will cause strict mode URPF to drop legitimate traffic. Loose mode causes the router to check if a route for the source address of the traffic exists. This may also cause legitimate traffic to be discarded. It is hoped that in the future, vendors will implement a DOS mitigation mode in addition to the loose and strict mode. In this mode, the URPF check will only fail if the next hop for the source of the packet is a discard interface. By enabling the URPF feature on interfaces at predetermined points in the network and announcing the source addresses of 
attack traffic a network operator can effectively drop the identified attack traffic at specified devices ideally ingress edge of their network based on source address while administrators may choose to drop traffic from any prefix they wish it is recommended when employing source-based rtbf filtering inter domain that explicit policy be defined that enables peers to only announce source-based rtbf routes for prefixes that they originate steps to deploy rtbf remotely triggered black hole filtering with urpf unicast reverse path forwarding for source filtering the same same steps that are required to implement destination address rtbf filtering are taken with the additional step of enabling unicast reverse path forwarding on predetermined interfaces when a source address or network needs to be blocked that address or network is announced using a bgp tag using bgp tagged with a community this will cause the route to be installed with a next hop of the discard interface causing the urpf check to fail and the packets to be discarded the destination based rtbf filtering community should not be used for source based rtbf filtering and the routes tagged with the selected community should be carefully filtered the bgp policy will need to be relaxed to accept accept announcements tagged with this community to be accepted even though they contain addresses not controlled by the network announcing them these announcements must not to be propagated outside the local as and should carry the no export community as a matter of policy operators should not accept source-based rtbh announcements from their peers or customers they should only be installed by local or attack management systems within their administrative domain security considerations the techniques presented here provide enough power to cause significant traffic forwarding loss if incorrectly deployed it is imperative that the announcements that trigger the black holing are carefully checked and that BGP policy that accepts these announcements is implemented in such a matter that these announcements are not propagated outside the AS, no export, are not accepted from outside the AS except from customers, except where source-based filtering is deployed, that the network contained in the announcement fails within the address ranges controlled by the announcing AS, i.e. for customers that the address falls within their space. All right, so let's do the example configuration they give, and then hopefully I'll, I'll be able to read all this. Um, I, I think, uh, just straight up reading RFCs out loud is kind of a inefficient way to prepare for this test. Um, but as you can see, the, the RFCs are, are often one of the most valuable resources you can, you can go to. They, they have a lot of really good information that is actually surprisingly well explained. You would think that the um, RFC would, would be kind of the, the least accessible resource but oftentimes the RFC is, is quite accessible to read huh that's funny exodus requirement so here's here's a section about the history of this and, and why they decided to come up with it in the first place so the history was in february of 2000 several big content hosting companies were attacked and brought down so this is based on a post-mortem conversation they had in which they came up with something they called the exodus requirement so quote 
we needed a tool to drop packets based on source IP address that can be pushed out to over 60 routers within 60 seconds, be longer than a thousand lines, be modified on the fly, and work in all your platforms filtering at line rate. So URPF, Unicast Reverse Path Forwarding Loose Check, was created as one part of a rapid reaction tool to DDoS attacks that drop packets based on source IP address that can be pushed out to over 60 routers within 60 seconds, be longer than a thousand lines, be modified on the fly, and work on all your platforms filtering at line rates that satisfy the exodus requirement. The secondary benefits of using um, <clears throat> URPF loose check for other functions is a secondary benefit, not the primary goal for its creation. Oh, that's nice. It wasn't ever patented because it was just such a big problem being attacked so much to just gave it free for all. So that's really nice of them too. Especially in a case like this where like, you know, if you're being attacked and you're down, you're not making as much money as, as people who aren't being attacked and are up. So, you know, to uh, copyright and, and sell this and, and patent it and say only companies that pay me can use this. Um, yeah, it, it's capitalism as long as it's not illegal. Um, it's not necessarily immoral. Um, well, as long as it's not illegal, um, depending on what your beliefs are, um, that could be fair game. But my personal belief, um, if it's a huge problem affecting a lot of people and you have a solution for it, um, it, it, it kind of the most ethical thing to do is to provide that solution. Um, and yeah, you, of course, you need to make a living too, but to make an excessive living. Um, there's a really good uh, video where they take uh, grains of rice to represent uh, $100,000, and then they show you how many grains of rice the average person gets, zero grains of rice, and then how many grains of rice um, the, uh, the top five the top 1% of people have. And um, I, I think it's, it's perfectly ethical for somebody to make a million dollars, even a hundred million dollars, even a billion dollars, but for somebody to make a hundred billion dollars, you can see that um, as represented in those mountains of rice, um, <clears throat> I think a much more preferable situation is, is where everyone has kind of equal competition and the reason you win or lose at something is not because of the, um, the place you got to start in the race, whether you had to run 10 feet or 10 miles, it's the speed at which you ran and the quality at which you prepared to, to run the race. I, I, I prefer a, a environment like that a lot more than one where um, whether or not you got a head start, um, whether or not you got to use a bike instead of just run or walk, um, that determines how successful you are. All right, so yeah, let's, let's go ahead and um, do this. So this section is partial. It's not meant to be the complete configuration. You're going to have to change it to what your needs are. But um, as far as understanding this concept of remotely triggered black holes, especially from the context of the source address, I think this is going to be invaluable to do. Oh, and this is exactly what we did before. Oh, and I can't do um, those kinds of comments. Let's do, um, because I, I'm pretty sure I already have um, Oh, and this is this is on router one, we got to configure this on router two. Um, and let's let's save the um, configuration.
Okay, and then that's uh, roll back to, to 23. And now let's, let's do their configuration and see how it compares. I have a feeling things like resolve and, and tag 666 are gonna be uh, included in theirs, but not in what was given to us by Juniper. So I'd like to understand that a little bit more and what's going to be required on the test. But as I said, I, I really, the math video I did a while ago where I figure out how fast I am moving showed that I'm really not moving fast enough at all. Okay, so here's a, the attack source. Now we're gonna set up an attack destination. There's really no difference though. Um, this, even the next hop is gonna be the same, whether it's the source or the destination. So this looks like it's the exact thing that was given to us in the documentation pretty much. Ah, and here's that range. And even though it's a slash 32, um, if you, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you wanna handle routes that are not properly marked as no exports. Okay, so this is for the um, announcing router. So we're also gonna have a configuration for the filtering router. So I'm not sure um, in the context of our example lab here, which is the announcing, which is the filtering. Let's commit the announcing config and then let's do a show pipe compare with um, the Juniper config that was given to us in that doc. So of course we didn't configure any um, IP addresses. Um, we didn't have the next hop the same way they did. We just had, uh, or, or we, have, we have multiple ones. We're using a different autonomous system, different name for the policy, different BGP group, um, 
but here's the difference between the policies. Yeah, so quite a bit different again. Yeah, pretty much unrelated. I wouldn't be surprised if it matched up more closely with what was um, what is given in, in here. Um, yeah, so. I think this one might be worth a read. So I, I'm going to be reading this. Um, I think I'm done with this for now. Um, I'm kind of tempted to, to do the filtering router config. You know what? I, I think I am going to do that. Oh. So I'll just do the, the filtering router config. Then I'll do the um, reading of the uh, RFC for RTBH for destination addresses. This is the one for source addresses. And then I'll mark this off, call it good, and we'll be done with uh, the second subtopic for BGP. And then we'll have just one more subtopic left, and then however many topics are part of that subtopic. So edit policy statement. Top edit policy options policy statement black from set is path um, set. Community black hole set route filter. Support. So here's that that classic perfect uh, community no export that that they really want you to to include on there. So it's one of the, um, yeah, so, so it's, it's essential to include that there. Oops, it looks like I, I forgot. Um, yeah, I, I noticed that. Where's the local only address? Yeah, I don't know why it's saying that there's a local only when, when there, there isn't one. Maybe it's just like a, it's just like a placeholder where you put your own AS in or something like that. So we won't be able to commit this, that's fine. Let's just finish the last part of the configuration. MTU is maximum transmission unit.
All right. So yeah, I, I'm gonna call that done. I don't know how confident I feel, but um, I understand the concept, which will be enough. I think I know how to get help on it. Topic BGP. Um, and just straight up on imports, I can get help. I can also get help on the discard interface, topic interface, um, DSC, yep, discard interface configuration. So, so I feel pretty good, especially since I know I can just uh, I've got secure CRT, so I can highlight the whole terminal, throw it in Notepad++, and um, see if there's anything I can use in this help menu for. Um, yeah, I think, I wonder if there's help topic policy options. I wonder if there's help for, for this specifically under policy options, like the kinds of yeah, like standards. Oh, no. Yeah, well, I don't even see anything. So let's move on. We're gonna end with RFC 3882, configuring BGP to block denial of service attacks. So the abstract, this document describes an operational technique that uses BGP communities to remotely trigger black holing of a particular destination network to block denial of service attacks. Black holing can be applied on a selection of routers rather than all BGP speaking routers in the network. The document also describes a sinkhole tunnel technique using BGP communities and tunnels to pull traffic into a sinkhole router for analysis. Number one, existing BGP triggered black holing techniques. Current BGP triggered black holing techniques rely on altering the BGP next top address of a network targeted by an attack throughout the IBGP network, a customized IBGP advertisement is generated from a router participating in the destination slash attack AS where the next hop address for the targeted network or host is modified to point to an RFC 1918 private internet address. <laughs> Most routers on the internet, especially edge routers, have static routes pointing at RFC 1918 addresses to the null interface. These static routes drive all traffic destined to the network under attack to the null interface. When an IBGP speaking router inside the destination AS receives the IBGP update, the advertised prefix will be added to the routing table with a next hop of one of the networks listed in RFC 1918. The router will then attempt to resolve the RFC 1918 next hop in order to qualify the route and derive a forwarding interface. This process will return a valid next hop as the null interface. Assuming the router is properly configured to direct RFC 1918 destined traffic to a null interface, traffic destined to the attacked network gets dropped, making the attacked network unreachable to the attacker and everyone else. While this technique shields the internal infrastructure from the attack protecting a large number of devices. <clears throat> it has un the undesirable side effect of rendering the targeted slash attacked network unreachable throughout the entire destination AS. 
even if the static route <clears throat> pointing to an RFC 1918 address to a null interface is not configured on all routers within the destination AS, the modified next hop makes the traffic unroutable to its legitimate destination. Network operators usually use the BGP triggered black holes for a short period of time. The technique causes traffic drops on all ingress points of the AS for traffic destined to the attacked network. By default, routers dropping traffic into a null interface should send an ICMP unreachable message to the source address belonging to the origin slash attacking AS. Once the procedure reaches this point, one of the source addresses of the attack traffic is hijacked by introducing a device with the same source IP address into the BGP domain of the destination slash attacked AS. The device hijacking the source AS collects the ICMP unreachable packets. The source addresses of these ICMP unreachable packets reveal which edge routers within the destination slash attacked AS the attack is coming from. The network operator may then opt to manually stop the traffic on the routers from which attack, attack traffic is entering. Enhanced BGP triggered black holing technique. This paper describes a technique developed to construct a, to instruct a selected set of routers to alter the next hop address of a particular prefix by use of the BGP protocol. The next hop can either be a null interface or as discussed later in this paper, a sinkhole tunnel interface. This technique does not involve an access list or rate limiting statement to treat tra attack traffic, nor does it involve a network wide change of the attacked prefix next hop address. The next hop will only be changed on a selection of routers with the aid of BGP communities within the destination slash attacked AS. To prepare the network for this technique, the network operator needs to define a unique community value for each destination AS border router that could potentially drive attack traffic to the victim. For example, a network with a BGP autonomous system number 65001 has two border routers, R1 and R2. Community value 65001 is assigned to identify R1. Community value 65001 is assigned to identify R2. And community value 65001 666 is assigned to identify both R1 and R2. After the following community assignment, R1 and R2 must be configured with the following. Number one, static route pointing an RFC 1918 network to a null interface. Number two, AS path access list that matches local BGP prefix advertisement. Number three, BGP community access list to match the community value assigned by the network operator for a particular router. Example, 65001 for R1. Number four, BGP community access list to match the community value assigned by the network operator for all routers, i.e. 65001 for R1 and R2. Under the BGP process, an IBGP import route policy should be applied on received IBGP advertisements to do the following logic. Statements are in a logical and order. So logic A, a policy statement to permit routes that match the following criteria and apply the following changes. One match for a community specific to that router, i.e. 65001 for R1. Two, match the AS path to locally generated BGP advertisements. Three, set the BGP next hop to an RFC 1918 network. Four, Overwrite the BGP K 
community with the well-known community, no advertise. B, a policy statement to permit routes that match the following criteria and apply the following changes. Number one, match for a community that covers all routers, i.e. 65001 colon 666. Two, match the AS path to locally generated BGP advertisements. Three, set the BGP next hop to an RFC 1918 network. Four, overwrite the BGP community with the well-known community, no advertise. After the policies have been configured on R1 and R2, the network operator can, in the case of an attack, advertise the targeted network that could be one or more slash 32 host routes into IBGP of the destination slash attack AS. The advertisement must contain the community value associated with the routers where the attack is arriving in addition to the well-known community, no export. Using BGP communities preserves the original next hop address of the targeted network on all routers where the special route policy configuration is not present. IBGP will then carry the prefix routers, the, the, the prefix advertisement to all routers in the destination slash attack AS. All communities stamped on the prefix except all, all, all routers within the destination prefix, except the ones that match the community stamped in the prefix will be oblivious to the community value and will install the network route with the legitimate next hop address. Routers that match the community will also install the network route into their routing table, but will alter the next hop address to an RFC 1918 network and then to the null interface as per the route policies configuration and recursive route lookup. The reason for matching locally announced networks is to make sure that no EBGB peer can misuse this community to drive any network to a null interface. Black holing the targeted slash attacked hosts is recommended but not the entire address block they belong to so that the black hole effect has the minimum impact on the targeted network. This technique stops traffic from getting forwarded to the legitimate destination on routers identified as transit routers for attack traffic and that have route map matches for the community value associated with the network advertisements. All other network on all other traffic on the network will still get forwarded to the legitimate destination, thus minimizing the impact on the targeted routes. So getting near the end, looks like we only got two full pages. The rest is just kind of <clears throat> acknowledgements and stuff. So number three, sinkhole tunnels. Following the enhanced BGP triggered black holing technique, BTGH, it's, oh, RTBH is what it was before. But so yeah, this is different. This is enhanced BGP triggered black holing technique. It's not remotely triggered black holes. It may become a requirement to take a look at the attack traffic for further analysis. This requirement adds to the complexity of the exercise. Usually with broadcast interfaces, network operators, install network sniffers on a spanned port of a switch for analysis of traffic. Another method would be to announce a network prefix that covers the attack host address onto IBGP, altering the next hop into a sinkhole device that can log traffic for analysis. The latter technique results in taking down the services offered on the targeted slash attacked IP addresses. Inter-AS traffic will be sucked into the sinkhole along with intra-AS traffic, oh, inter-AS along with intra-AS. Packet level analysis involves redirecting traffic away from the destination host to a sniffer or router. As a result, if the traffic being examined includes legitimate traffic, 
that legitimate traffic will never make it to the destination host. This will result in denial of service for the legitimate traffic. A better alternative would be to use a sinkhole tunnel. A sinkhole tunnel is implemented at all possible entry points from which attacks can pass into the destination slash attack AS. Using the BGP community technique, traffic destined to the attacked slash targeted host could be rerouted to a special path tunnel where a sniffer could capture the traffic for analysis. After being analyzed, traffic will exit the tunnel and be forward, be routed normally to the destination host. In other words, the traffic will pass through the network to a sniffer without altering the next hop information of the destination network. All routers within the destination slash attacked AS IBGP domain will have the proper next hop address. Only the entry point router will have the altered next hop information. To detail the procedure, a sinkhole router with an optional sniffer attached to its interface is installed and configured to participate in the IGP and IBGP of the attack AS. Next, a tunnel is created using MPLS traffic engineering as an example from all border routers attacks can potentially enter from inter-AS traffic to the sinkhole router. When a host or network is under attack, a customized IBGP advertisement is sent to announce the network address of the attacked hosts with the proper next hop that ensures traffic will reach a, these ho hosts or networks. The customized advertisement will also have a community stream value that matches the set of border routers the attack is entering from as described in section two. The new next hop address configured within the route policy section of all border routers should be the sinkhole IP address. This IP address belongs to the slash 30 subnet assigned to the tunnel connecting the border router to the sinkhole router. Routers that do not have a match for the community string, will do regular routing. Lack of a community string match on these routers will ensure that the special route community does not change the next hop address. Traffic engineering, traffic entering from border routers that do not have a match to the special community will pass through regular router interfaces to the legitimate destination. It might also be required to allow the traffic to reach its destination after being captured. In this case, a default network route is configured to point to any interface attached and configured on the IBGP network. This would also include the same physical interface the tunnel is built on. Since the next hop address is not changed on the sinkhole device, Traffic entering this device from the tunnel will be sent back to the network due to the presence of the default route. Routing protocols will then take care of properly routing the traffic to its original destination, attacked network. It becomes apparent that this technique can also be used for purposes other than analyzing attack traffic. Legitimate traffic could also be pulled out of normal routing into a tunnel and then reinserted into the backbone without altering the next hop addressing scheme throughout the IBGP network. Multicast traffic engineering with its many features is a good method of sliding traffic into the sinkhole device. Features like QoS policies can be applied on the attack traffic, thus preventing it from competing on resources with legitimate traffic. To be able to, router, to alter the next hop on the border router, a subset of an RFC 1918 network is statically routed to the tunnel interface. An example of the static route is 
IP route. So this looks like a Cisco example. Cisco, it looks like they call it tunnel zero. Juniper is gonna be the DSC interface. Setting the next hop of the target IP address to the 192.168.0.12/32 will force the traffic to go through the tunnel. Traffic is, oh, it's a tunnel interface, not a Cisco interface. Tunnel is received at the sinkhole interface via the TE tunnel. Subsequently, three methods could be installed, namely rate limiting policies, QoS policies, and access lists. These policies could rate limit or drop traffic classified as attack traffic. This process would be completed on the interface of the sinkhole device. Another useful application for a sinkhole router is to pull in traffic via tunnels to an inbound interface and to have a default route statement forwarding the traffic out to an ethernet interface. The ethernet interface is connected to the IBGP network and guarantees proper delivery of traffic. However, it still allows the use of a packet sniffer to further analyze the attack traffic. This becomes very useful when it is not feasible to apply an access list or a rate limiting statement on the BGP border router or last hop router before the attacked host or network because of hardware or software limitations. Hence, instead of upgrading interfaces at the point of entry of attack interface, the ladder could be pulled into the sinkhole and treated on that device. Operational costs can be rendered minimal if the sinkhole router is a powerful device. And then uh, security considerations, it is very important to practice tight security control over eBGP peering points before implementing the techniques described in this paper. eBGP customers might be able to black hole a particular subnet using the black hole communities. To eliminate this risk, the match for locally generated BGP advertisements in the special role policy should not be neglected. So yep, as you can use it against them, they can use it against you if you don't set it up properly. But that's the end of um, what I had accidentally <laughs> turned into a mega topic. It was gonna be kind of a shorter topic, it was just one exercise, but we did that exercise. We looked at some wire crusher captures to see that in fact those ICMP pings were not propagated through the link because of the protections we had set up. Uh, we read in two entire RFCs, um, just for more clear information. We learned that remote triggering black holes can be done uh, based on a source or a destination address. So, yep, I'm gonna mark it done. Um, fortunately, I will admit, I don't feel like this is my strongest subject right now, but um, I, I think I have some sense of, of how to do it. You just, um, <clears throat> you just uh, configure that discarding interface and then make a policy that um, sends traffic to that interface. So yeah, I'm gonna say that this is done. Feels good to have it done. Um, I might do, do another math video on this just to see how, how good I'm doing, but I, I think I'll save the math video for um, this whole uh, topic here, because I'll have one, two, three, four, five topics to go after that. So I'll just take the total amount of hours I spent on, on BGP, uh, multiply it by five and divide it by the number of days before the test to see how many hours a day I need to spend studying to be prepared for the test. And if it's something ridiculous like it was before, I need to spend about four hours a day, maybe three and a half. Um, I'll, I'll try to up the pace on these videos, um, which I seem to be failing at so far, but um, but yeah, I'll have to, um, <clears throat> to uh, move faster. All right, thanks for watching the video. See you in the next one where we learn about BGP scaling through route configuration and um, route reflection.